All right, good afternoon. Hi there, my name is Toss Cochran. I am the Director of Neuroethics at the Center for Bioethics uh, here at the Medical School. Uh, welcome to the Neuroethics Seminar Series. Uh, this, uh, this particular seminar was planned before my time, uh, but boy, is it brilliant. It's going to be uh, you know, some of the uh, top people in the field of uh, neurology, consciousness, and ethics uh, talking about a cutting-edge technology uh, that promises to have some important implications for uh, patient care. Uh, and so before I introduce our speakers, I would like to thank our uh, funders and our co-sponsors, the Mind Brain Behavior uh, Initiative at Harvard and the Harvard Brain Initiative uh, are uh, important funders for us, and the International Neuroethics Society uh, provides funding that allows us to live stream this and post the videos afterwards, uh, uh, which is important. So thank you to them, and thank you to anybody who's joining us via the live stream. If you are following the webcast, you can tweet questions and comments to us at uh, HMS Bioethics is our, is our handle, and I encourage you to do so. Our co-sponsors are listed here, uh, but in the interest of time, because I know the discussion will be sort of the most important and engaging part of the evening, uh, let me jump in and introduce our speakers. Uh, I'm going to uh, try and introduce uh, everyone all at once, um, which uh, will be difficult to remember everybody, but I'm not going to do them justice anyway. Uh, so I'll, let, me, let me sort of put them out on the table and then let, let them uh, take the floor from here. The first person who's going to speak is uh, David Fisher, who's one of our uh, fourth-year medical students uh, who, uh, in large measure, arranged this conference uh, and who uh, knows a lot about the field, has published in the field. And he's, he's going to give us an introduction to disorders of consciousness and the new technologies that we're going to be talking about tonight, especially functional MRI imaging in disorders of consciousness. Let me talk about our three speakers. So our first speaker isn't here yet. His uh, airplane was held up on the runway in New York, but, but uh, reportedly it landed at 3.30, so I expect he'll walk in at any moment. Uh, and that is Joe Finns, who is the William Davis uh, Professor of Medical Ethics and Medicine at Weill Cornell Medical College. Uh, he's the co-director of the Consortium for the Advanced Study of Brain Injury at Weill Cornell and Rockefeller University. Uh, and he recently published a book, uh, came out in August, called Rights Come to Mind, uh, Brain Injury, Ethics, and the Struggle for Consciousness. Uh, I've read it over the weekend. Uh, it's a very important book. Uh, it's very well done. I highly recommend it. Um, and you know I'm not just flattering him because he's not here yet to hear me do that. Uh, instead, of, instead of Joe Finns, our first speaker will be uh, Joe Giacino, who is the Director of Rehabilitation Neuropsychology and Disorders of Consciousness Program at Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital, uh, and an Associate Professor in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehab here at the Medical School. Uh, he was a co-chair of the Aspen Work Group, which was responsible for developing the diagnostic criteria for the minimally conscious state, which you'll hear about and the co-lead author of the Mohonk Report, which was uh, an initiative to establish recommendations for lifelong care of patients with disorders of consciousness. Uh, he currently chairs the Vegetative State and Minimally Conscious State Guideline Development Panel at the American Academy of Neurology, uh, and so will be influential in, in terms of how we care for these patients in the future. And he's currently investigating fMRI techniques for investigating uh, visual and linguistic uh, awareness or consciousness in patients with disorders of consciousness. So Joe Giacino is going to speak fir uh, first after David's introduction. And then finally, uh, Jim Burnett is the Lewis and Ruth Frank Professor of Neuroscience at Dartmouth Medical School. He is the uh, director of the program in clinical ethics at the Medical Center, and he previously served as assistant dean at the Dartmouth Medical School. Uh, he served for 28 years. Uh, uh, on the American Academy of Neurology's Ethics, Law, and Humanities Committee uh, with 10 years as the chairman. And he, uh, in, in every relevant sense, wrote the book in my field. Uh, uh, the book is called Ethical Issues in Neurology. It was one of the first most important books I read in ethics, and it's a, it's a must-have for anybody interested in the ethics, uh, in the intersection of ethics and neurology. So, uh, thank you to all our speakers, and now I'm going to have uh, David come up and tell us about consciousness and imaging. 
All right, so thanks, Dr. Cochran. So, uh, yep, my name's David. I'm a fourth year medical student here at Harvard. And um, there are people here with much more interesting and informed views than my own, so I'll be brief. Uh, but I just want to give you kind of a general overview of uh, the types of disorders that we're talking about and the kinds of problems that we're uh, faced with with these disorders. So when we're talking about disorders of consciousness, a kind of logical place to start is asking, well, what is consciousness? Obviously, that's a complicated question that we're not going to be able to answer tonight, let alone in this introduction. Um, but it's good to have some kind of general framework to think about it. So consciousness is, can be thought of at, in at least two parts. Uh, one is arousal or wakefulness, just being awake. And the second is awareness of the self, of the environment, um, essentially the content of one's experience. And we think about, um, for the most part, we think about awareness as relying on arousal in that you need to be awake, first and foremost, in order to be aware of the things around you. Okay, so what are the disorders of consciousness? So there's a few kind of main types. Uh, first is coma. So in coma, you, uh, patients lack arousal and therefore also lack awareness. Um, how can you tell that these patients lack arousal? Well, for example, they don't open their eyes spontaneously, they don't open their eyes to any kind of sensory stimulation. And so essentially they have really no signs of consciousness in either sense. After that is the vegetative state. These patients are awake for the most part, but lack awareness of their self in the environment. And when this, uh, for that reason, this is also called the unresponsive wakefulness syndrome. When this state persists for over a month, we call it the persistent vegetative state, which is also a term that you may have heard. So after the vegetative state, there's the minimally conscious state. Now, the minimally conscious state is similar to the vegetative state in the sense that these are patients who are awake and have some kind of impairment, more specifically in awareness, but unlike the vegetative state, they do still have some semblance of awareness. So it might be minimal, it might be fluctuating, but they're still aware in some sense. So that means that the, essentially the distinction between the vegetative state and the minimally conscious state is, is there any conscious awareness at all in the patient? And you can imagine that that's an important distinction for family members, um, for medical management. It matters to know, are these patients actually aware of what's going on or not? So that leads to the next question. Well, how do we determine if a patient's aware? Uh, that's a subjective experience. Well, mostly you do that on the basis of behavioral demonstrations of awareness. What are behavioral demonstrations of awareness? Well, we have some criteria to help us with that. Following simple commands, making gestural or verbal yes or no responses, making intelligible verbalizations, and any kind of purposeful non-reflexive behaviors, like smiling or crying in response to emotional stimuli, reaching for, touching, or holding objects, or following a target with one's eyes or fixating on salient stimuli, these are all behaviors that are thought to signify some kind of underlying level of conscious awareness. And uh, when they are uh, done in a reproducible and kind of sustainable way, we, th we, th we think that probably these patients are at least minimally conscious. Now there's a problem here. So when, when these behaviors are present, we say that likely that's a minimally conscious state. When they're absent, we say, well, probably that's a vegetative state, meaning that these patients probably have no conscious awareness at all. But there's a danger in that, which is that the absence of evidence isn't necessarily the evidence of absence. And what I mean by that is that there are reasons why you might not have any of the behaviors on the previous slide while still being conscious. So for example, you might have sensory impairment, motor impairment, speech impairment, cognitive impairment. There might be medical equipment that makes it hard for you to interact. Or your levels of awareness might just be fluctuating, and the doctors you know, or the healthcare professionals just happen to catch you at the wrong time. And so in fact, there are studies that suggest that an estimated 40% of patients in a vegetative state, patients presumed to be entirely unaware, actually do show subtle behavioral signs that in fact they are aware. Now that's a, behavior, that's a kind of issue in its own right, but it also raises a deeper question, which is that, well, what if you're a patient who's conscious but you have no way of demonstrating it behaviorally, um, which is plausible, right? Well, uh, that would be missed with these kind of behavioral techniques. And so uh, we get into another possibility, which is what if we use neuroimaging to help us? So there was a study in 2006 where a patient who, uh, for the most part, was unresponsive and therefore considered to be vegetative, uh, was put in an fMRI, functional MRI machine, and asked to imagine either playing tennis or imagine visiting the rooms of her house. Now, when healthy people do this, if they are asked to imagine playing tennis, they'll activate regions of their brain that are associated with movement. If they're asked to imagine walking through a house, they'll activate parts of their brain associated with spatial navigation. And in fact, this patient could do this essentially just as well. 
suggesting that this patient could actually voluntarily modulate their brain activity, even though there was no way of, from looking at them, really, that they were consciously aware. And that there are some pretty you know, Im interesting implications from that. You know, it would be a pretty, pretty terrifying experience if you were a patient who was conscious but had no way of demonstrating it. And in fact, there was a uh, study that followed up on this kind of study that used this method to have a patient who was also essentially non-communicative, unable to answer you know, yes or no questions, who could use these kind of imagery tasks to answer yes or no questions. So they would say, OK, I'm going to ask you these questions. If the answer is yes, imagine playing tennis. If the answer is no, um, imagine walking through your house. And they could accurately, this patient could accurately and reliably answer these questions using this technique, even though they were not able to do that behaviorally. So um, these findings obviously have very interesting kind of uh, implications. And you can imagine that there's lots of you know, promises for this type of technology, but also a lot of potential pitfalls. So, uh, without further ado, I'll bring up our panelists, um, and I guess we'll start with uh, Dr. Burnett, did we decide? Who, Dr. Giacino? Okay. So thanks, David. Uh, I think a, a, a very um, suitable introduction for where, where we're going to go. I have to turn on. Oh, yeah. Um, so I think my role here is, is a little bit of a stage setter uh, for the real speakers for the evening, Drs. Uh, Burnett and Finns. Fingers crossed I'm Dr. Finns. Um, so I'm going to be the guy with the boots on the ground in the sense that so my team is uh, carrying out this work, um, some of whom are here. And um, the, this work is in collaboration with um, uh, the uh, Functional Neuroimaging Lab at Brigham and Women's Hospital. So we've been working together on this project for um, most of the time I've been here, so approaching five years. So what I want to do is to tell you a little bit about this work that you just saw a little bit of, about um, in the um, review that the brief review that David just did. But what I want to do it, I really want to do is to kind of begin to highlight some of the issues along the way, but really then start to move us towards some of the tricky issues that come up when we're engaged in this type of work. So um, this is our study. It's, um, it's funded by the, that's actually a name change. So it's now the National Institute on Disability Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research. Uh, it's a, uh, a division of HHS. And so this study is entitled, as you see, Looking for Consciousness, a Novel Functional Neuroimaging Approach for Detection of Visual Cognition in Patients with Severe TBI and Disorders of Consciousness. So you just heard the story from David. Um, why are we doing this? Because we know that some percentage, nobody quite knows what percentage of individuals um, who are believed to be unconscious are actually conscious. So we want better techniques than bedside examination allows um, to be able to detect those individuals because maybe then we can, we don't, those individuals who are conscious, we don't know how conscious they are. So we have ways to at least now begin to tell us about the prospects for consciousness when behavioral signs fail us, but we really don't have a sense of where they, how high up the ladder they, they go. Um, why is this problem so significant and so persistent? And that is the problem of misdiagnosis. So sometimes we just don't investigate carefully enough. A bedside exam takes 10 minutes. The routine tests are given a few commands, a few prods and pricks here and there, and on to the next patient. So that's probably not ad adequate. Behavioral signs are often misleading. Dr. Finns has arrived. We're all sighing uh, with great. Uh, <laughs> Um, welcome, Joe. Um, behavioral signs can be misleading. So David had a slide talking about all the potential underlying, unrecognized sensory, motor, cognitive, language problems that get in the way. And uh, so the it's a very difficult task. So some of these, some of the variance, if you will, is contributed by the examiner and some by the patient. What are the consequences? Well. So I've been looking for data to support this top premise, which I know to be true, but it's very hard to get data to support it. And that is, if an individual has a diagnosis of vegetative state in the neuro ICU, for example, their prospects of getting to rehabilitation, even though they're very early post-injury, are less than if they don't carry that same label. Um, again, you'd have to sort of accept my word, because I can't 
provide evidence for that, but I believe that to be true. Also, a misdiagnosis, meaning missed consciousness, may delay use of interventions that could otherwise promote recovery and could even lead to inappropriate or harmful interventions, in some cases, withdrawal of care, which we get very concerned about um, in the neuro ICU setting. So you saw the um, two uh, studies that sort of started the search for consciousness away from the bedside through functional neuroimaging, the Adrian Owens group in, in the, uh, science, and then Martin Monti, who was part of Owens group, who pushed forward uh, and developed the communication paradigm. So I'll just say another word, a couple words about the Monty paper. So once establishing that um, in healthy volunteers, by asking them to imagine playing tennis or imagine, imagine walking around the rooms of, of their house, you can with 100% accuracy by looking at the activation profile, figure out which of those two tasks they're doing. What Monty did was take it a step further and say, let's turn this into a communication system. So now, what I want you to do is answer some basic questions. If your answer is yes, imagine playing tennis. If your answer is no, imagine walking around the rooms of your house. And showed, again, that healthy volunteers can do this um, task very well and that um, naive observers can figure out their answers with very high accuracy. Monty did the study in 54 patients. Uh, about 23 of them were in a minimally conscious state and the remainder in vegetative state found that five out of the 54 could follow the commands, like the, uh, in the Owen paradigm, and one of those 54 was actually correctly signaling yes and no answers. Now, it turns out that that patient was in a minimally conscious state, not a vegetative state. Um, so it isn't that that patient lacked any consciousness, but there was no way to engage a communication um, system with that individual except through this functional neuroimaging methodology. But here's where I want to raise one of the questions, um, and that is about sensitivity and specificity of these techniques. So what you don't see in that paper is that, let's just take for a moment the 23 patients in MCS. All of those patients were known to be in MCS because a bedside examination done carefully had detected clear evidence, clearly discernible evidence of conscious awareness. But remember the numbers. So out of the 23 MCS patients found to have behavioral evidence of conscious awareness, only five could follow commands using the imaging paradigm. And then, of course, just one had communication. Now, we'll put the communication aside because none of the 23 could communicate. But that's really poor sensitivity, right? So five out of 23 that were discerned on bedside exam failed the imaging test. So we miss a lot. And the danger is interpreting the negative, which we don't ever want to do under, under these circumstances. So our, I'm not going to take you through um, the gory detail of this study, but just to give you a sense of what, um, what's going on in this, in this space. So we had two aims. And one was to develop a, more, a simpler paradigm for detecting conscious awareness. So another way to get people to sort of follow simple instructions and answer yes, no questions, then using imagery. Imagery is hard. We know that it's not so easy for healthy people, let alone individuals with severe brain injury. So we wanted to come up with a simpler task. And then we were interested in comparing the hit rate, if you will, between neuroimaging studies that look at command following and communication with um, the bedside examination using a standardized measure, the coma recovery scale, with the family's observations. So we did structured interviews asking the family, so do you think so-and-so can follow simple instructions? Do you think so-and-so can indicate yes and no answers? And so we end up with this matrix where we plug in the results of the three modalities, if you will, or, or ways of interrogation, and figure out how much agreement or disagreement there is. So that's what we're interested in. Uh, and our subjects were uh, are 10 individuals in vegetative state, so completely unconscious, 10 in minimally conscious state, 10 in post-traumatic confusional state. That's the next step up, right? So we want to include a group that's a sort of a contrast group. No question that they're conscious, no question whatsoever, but they're severely brain injured and still cognitively very compromised, so they should actually be able to perform these tasks. 
would be the idea. And then, of course, controls. So complex paradigm, but for our purposes, all I really need you to know is when people are in the scanner, they're going to do, they're going to be exposed to three types of stimulation while in the scanner. Passive stimulation. So they are asked to do nothing but simply to look at different types of visual stimuli. The word yes versus pictures of um, uh, scenes or buildings. Why these two stimuli? Because there are super selective areas in the brain that respond to words, and then a different area of the brain that selectively responds to scenes. So we want to be sure that the visual pathway is working and that the, the hardware for detection of a word is active, as well as the hardware for detection of um, landscape scenes or spatial scenes uh, is also active. And that, for the reason for that is because we're then going to move to the active stimulation paradigms. So now we're going to give them instructions. They wear goggles in the scanner, and they're asked to either look at the word yes or to look at the picture. So that's our command following protocol. If they look at the word yes, we get activation in the, in the visual word form area. If they look at the landscape scene, they get activation in the parahippocampal place area. And the idea is that these areas are discernible or clearly different uh, or different enough that we can tell which thing they're doing. So if we see this activation profile, they're looking at the word yes. If they're, we see this, they're looking at the picture scene. But then we take it to that next level. So now we say, and here's the simplified aspect of the protocol, we're going to ask you some questions. If your answer is yes, look at the word yes. If your answer is no, look at the picture. Right? So we've turned it into an augmentative communication system that works off the same premise. So hopefully that's sort of clear. That's the, that's the, the idea here. We are still acquiring data on this paradigm. So this is just another look at what we are hoping to see the differences between uh, activation of the, of the visual word form area versus the parahippocampal place area. So they're discernibly, discernibly different and should be able to tell us whether the person is following the instructions correctly and then answering yes or no. And then what we do with this at the end of the day is we produce, and this is sort of material for discussion, we produce a report which details the um, tasks that we did, the findings that we got, and we furnish this information to whoever provided consent. So this would be surrogate consent because patients obviously can't um, uh, decide for themselves whether they consent. And so they have these results in hand, and our IRB has said, once you give the results to the, in, to the surrogates, it's up to them what they do with them. You can't hand them off, but the, but the family can hand them off if they want. So that's going to set the stage for some, um, some discussion later. Um, Toss, I can stop here. So I mean, the, the question is, next up. OK. OK. So let me give you two case vignettes. So these are pretty close to the belt case vignettes. Um, that have come up along the way for us and have led to lots of um, fairly intense, um, very interesting debate about how to use research findings outside of the research. Now, some people would simply say it's just not to be done under any circumstance. I don't know that you're going to hear that from all of our speakers today, but you might. Um, families will usually tell us. We've run, run focus groups with families. And uh, most of the time, they tell us, well, look, we want you to tell us what you think, obviously, from your research findings. But we don't want you to hold anything back from us. We want the right to use the information or not. You have to tell us about the concerns, the uh, constraints, et cetera. But we want that information. And we want to use it the way we think is best. So let me give you. Case one. So here we have a clinician who's also involved in research activities. And the clinician's treating a 20-year-old college student who's in a coma as a result of a severe TBI as, uh, that occurred in the, as, uh, following a motor vehicle accident. He's three days out from the injury. 
So the clinical team is scheduled to meet with the family to talk about the patient's prognosis and determine how aggressive care should be. The prog prognostic indicators that have been acquired to date suggest a pretty high probability of an unfavorable outcome. Most likely, if you apply the, the conventional wisdom, this person will stay in a vegetative state or, at best, have severe disability. The clinician is interested in getting as much information as possible to inform his judgment of prognosis and is familiar with the neurodiagnostic procedure that's still undergoing investigation as a prognostic tool, but has shown some promising preliminary results. Clinician is also aware that the new procedure remains investigational, but is considering ordering that study for clinical purposes based on the premise that many routine clinical studies lack an established base of evidence and have the same level of risk as this one. Because this is a life and death decision, literally, could this information help inform the decision? So the question is, should the clinician researcher go forward and get these, get the studies outside of the um, research protocol for purposes of management of this case? So I'm sure there are some people who are saying, absolutely not. Some people are in the middle, and maybe some people even pushing the other side. So do you want to leave this where it is? Do you want to engage discussion? How do you want to? Um, I think we're pretty well teed up. Uh, OK. We can stop. provides a nice case, and I think that will segue nicely. Yeah, I, I know that um, both of our speakers are going to be happy to jump on that. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're adjusting on the fly, given. Uh, Dr. Finns, you'll have to trust that I gave you a glowing introduction and that I did mention your book uh, and that I did recommend it to the audience. Great, Everyone thank you. Will, I'm just glad to be here. Back me up my that. flight was, we were taking off from LaGuardia and mid, mid runway they aborted the takeoff and there was an engine failure. So. I'm glad to be here. Okay. Right. Oh, yeah, okay. We're not powered up. That's why it's not uh, reading yet, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Laptop. Yeah, that says laptop. That says podium laptop. Are you live? Oh, okay. Uh, it doesn't actually look like it's there yet. I think that might have got it. There you go. Oh, we're close. Okay, great. We're close. Well, at a minimum, we'll, I think you'll be able to see a side of it. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, again, thanks for the invitation uh, to be here. And um, what I'm going to try to do is, is, is to place a lot of what wherever Joe went, Joe's comments into a sort of a bioethical context and, um, and, and just start off with some uh, comment from John Dewey, uh, who was a mid-century philosopher, who was very interested in pragmatism, instrumentalism, and sort of the relationship between theory and practice. And, and he has this uh, great comment, I think, because we're here because of emerging technology, that inventions of new agencies and instruments create new ends, they create new consequences, which stir men to form new purposes. And I think one of the fundamental issues here is that before we had this neuroimaging technology, we didn't have this problem. We did not know there was a discordance between what people did behaviorally and what they might be going on internally in their brains. So technology um, sort of opens us up to this problem. And technology also, interestingly, might be part of the solution. Now, I just want to, uh, and I, I miss David's talk. I presume you, you're David, and I presume you gave the talk. <laughs> and, um, but I, and, and I saw your slides. But I just want to just remind us how far we've come in a very short period of time. Since, since all of us old guys were in medical school, this is basically all new news. And Lewis Thomas, who was a great physician writer, 
1980, uh, wrote, the you know, nature of consciousness is a scientific problem, but still an unapproachable one. It's becoming approachable, and, and we're at the cusp of, of this new knowledge, but of course it creates new problems. I, I share this picture because David didn't, didn't put this, this earlier uh, uh, picture in his slide uh, set um, for two reasons. One is that Jim Burnett and I are both on the front page of the New York Times, and it was commenting on a, a paper about a passive stimulation that Nico Schiff and Joy Hirsch uh, and colleagues from, and Joe uh, and Fred Plum, colleagues did it at Cornell, which showed, which for me was, for me personally, a huge eye opener. This was a, a, a forward, backwards language paradigm that was played to patients who were in the minimally conscious state. And these folks actually uh, registered language in the forward direction, but not backwards. So the same frequency spectrum uh, didn't, uh, didn't elicit the same response. So they were processing language. That was like a real eye opener. And it happened in 2005, right at the midst of the Shibo case exploding. Um, and and it, it points out at what I said on the front page here. This, this study gave me goosebumps because it shows this possibility of this profound isolation. These people are there, they've been there all along, even though we've been treating them as if they're not. And that's the moral crux of the problem, okay? These people who heretofore were, were diagnosed as vegetative may actually be responding to the outside world. And the Venn diagram that once was the vegetative state, and we don't have time to get into all of this, there was a subset of people who were minimally conscious. And through the heroic efforts of Joe Giacino and other colleagues, we've begun to parcelate out this other category of people. And that's a difference that makes a difference. The other point I want to make in showing this slide and, and this slide here is that the minimally conscious state has a net, they, they, they have network responses. And the way the brain, as I understand it, works is through uh, a series of networks. This is a, a study that Stephen Lorries did in, in Liege about pain stimulation and patients who were vegetative. All they do is light up the primary sensory area. They do not activate the network response. So one of the major <coughs> distinctions between this category of patient and vegetative patients is the possibility of network response, and we'll see how that's important. I think you've covered this uh, with the, the uh, Adrian Owen study, uh, but, but I want to just put it into slightly different language about motor cognitive dissociation. Again, what patients do behaviorally is not what they're doing uh, on the scanner. Um, and Nico Schiff and I wrote a little piece in the Hastings Center report around that time calling this non-behavioral uh, MCS. Um, so back in 2007, just to give you a sense of how rapidly progressing this history is, uh, a number of us were at a conference at Stanford, uh, including uh, Jim and, and, uh, and uh, uh, I think that's and Nico, and, and uh, I don't know if Joe, were, Joe was there. And, and the conclusion in 2007 was that, that these results were not ready for prime time uh, eight years ago. Uh, and, that, and that there were all kinds of reasons to be very cautious about sharing these <coughs> results with families, and they were still in their research purview. And then, of course, this study came in, uh, as, as Joe described. And I want to make two points in addition to what he said. The first is there are real sensitivity and specificity uh, issues, and it's the primacy of the exam. The coma recovery scale that, that Joe helped to originate was, was better than neuroimaging. So whatever we say about neuroimaging, the behavioral bedside exam in the skilled hands of a skilled neuropsychologist, and most people who do this are neuropsychologists, is more accurate uh, than the neuroimaging studies. Uh, so it's kind of a utilitarian, you know, greatest good for various number. However, the neuroimaging study for that one patient uh, had, a, had a real impact for that one individual. However, as Joe pointed out, and if you read through the lines carefully, uh, that patient turned out to be minimally conscious retrospectively after the imaging study pointed them more aggressively to the behavioral exam, but had, would not have been identified perhaps without the neuroimaging. Of course, they established the communication channel. So, so, so <coughs> the question is, what do we do with all this new information? And, and, and as a bioethicist, we've all been schooled about this sort of strict dichotomy between research and therapy, between the clinic uh, and the research encounter. And I think this distinction sort of fades at the margins here. And drawing upon the work of Susan Wolf, writing about incidental findings, uh, she's written that, that, that research findings can be shared with, with individuals or with surrogates. Um, 
uh, when there's an emerging view that researchers bear some clinical responsibility towards research subjects. Um, and the, uh, the italics are added there. And the criteria for this is, uh, does the information have potential health or reproductive significance? The validity of the test, and Joe was talking about that earlier. Does some discrimination between the risks and benefits of disclosure and the utility of the information? More recently, Henry Richardson, who's a philosopher at Georgetown, wrote this marvelous book uh, entitled Moral Entanglements, in which he's thinking about research ethics in the developing world. You're doing a study on, 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 on AIDS in, 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 uh, in <coughs> sub-Saharan Africa, and people have schistosomiasis, and you have the resources to treat those people. Should you treat the schistosomiasis? It's federally, it's prohibited by federal law to use research dollars to treat clinical problems overseas. But he makes a very compelling argument um, that, 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 that subjects uh, should receive uh, some degree of clinical care based on your degree of interaction with them, their degree of need. Um, and uh, he really begins to uh, erode this dichotomy between research and, and practice. And, and I, when I reviewed this book for, the, for, for, um, for a journal, um, I, I related it to the needs of this population. And this population uh, is so woefully undertreated and underattended to uh, in the clinical context that many times the investigators who are, who are working with these people have information that no one else can get and have, a, I think, a profound moral obligation to provide some help and share their expertise. This is a piece that I wrote in the American uh, Archives of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation Medicine um, that begins to describe some of these problems, and the book also catalogs this in detail. These people you know, suffer from you know, premature discharge, premature palliative care recommendations, uh, they're often uh, seen as uh, potential organ donors before they've declared themselves. Uh, they're discharged to places without, without a credible diagnosis. Sometimes they're given a false diagnosis to ease discharge. All these things are, are, are cataloged in the book based on interviews with uh, over 50 uh, families. Um, so I think that there's, there's a real need, and I think if we think about it in the context of ancillary care obligations, that dichotomy between research and clinical work begins to it get a, gets a, gets a little little grayer in the middle. So let's talk about some of these these issues about proportionality and risk. Well, first of all, all the technologies we're talking about fMRI or DTI, which is a structural a structural utility, not a functional study, <coughs> and PET, which looks at uh, metabolic activity, are minimal risk or slightly more than minimal risk and they're established as safe and routine clinical practice. We're not talking about new interventions that we don't quite understand. There are methodological risks that I thought Joe was going to describe, but since I got here late, he has described. And that really hinges on a couple of things, positive versus negative results. And because of what he described, a negative result is never just positive. Uh, and the issue is really of type 2 error failing to identify consciousness when it is present. In, in that kind of issue. The second point is timing. Uh, this is a really important point, and, and there's a recent paper from Canada about the utility of neuroimaging early on. And one of, the pro one of the things that you just have to remember that these are not diagnoses. These are brain states. And it's like the difference between a fixed dementia and a delirium. People transit from one of these states to another. So when, the, when people are moving from coma to the vegetative state, to the persistent, to, to the vegetative state, and then into the minimally conscious state, it's a moving target. For traumatic brain injury, it's up to a year. For anoxic brain injury, it's three months. And if you get hypother hypothermia for a cardiac arrest after anoxic brain injury, you really don't know what the outlier is because that's changed uh, the Levy criteria. So the point of using neuroimaging, as much as we invest in technology, if you label somebody in a certain way, early on, it could become stigmatizing, and it could be a label they carry forever. So it's very, very uh, concerning. It doesn't mean we shouldn't do neuroimaging on these patients, but we should understand there's a contingency because they're going to evolve over time. Now, Fred Plum, this issue of contingency, Fred Plum, who many of you may have heard of, um, who, who identified the vegetative state with Brian Jeanette and also the locked-in state and was, was my teacher, um, had this, uh, this quote uh, about, about probabilities. And I think a lot of this is probabilistic. He said, you know, there are absolute versus probabilities. 
in ethical decisions. Probably the most difficult yet crucial point to be discussed is the one of relativism, when one can rely on the probabilities of an occurrence in reaching an ethical decision rather than await the def definitive event no matter how unlikely. This is the point. Many ethicists hold the beliefs that are at least stated in absolute terms. By contrast, an increasing number of medical problems tend to be decided in relative terms. And, and Jim is also a student of Fred Plum. So the fact that two of us are, are here, um, it may be uh, an endorsement or not of Dr. Plum's uh, pedagogy. But the, that, was, that was a joke, guys. Okay. We're very serious here in Boston. Um, so the point is we can't think about this as much in absolutist terms because it's really more nuanced than that. So how do we deal with the sensitivity and specificity issues that Joe described? I think we have to understand every single test that we use against a Bayesian pretest probability. Yes, history and physical matter. And does it make biological sense that we're kind of moving in a certain direction that somebody's got a certain kind of a diagnosis. Uh, also, the behavioral metrics, when properly done, are better than neuroimaging, and that requires expertise. Also, because the minimally conscious state itself is, is a state where the behaviors are episodically and intermittently presented, you can't have one data point. You have to do this uh, repeatedly over time and in different times of the day, because people's diagnosis or state depends on their highest degree of function, not what they often do, but what they do one or one or two times. The metaphor is it's kind of like a flickering uh, circuit in a light bulb. The fact that the circuit can flicker means that, that the network is intact. Again, the intact network the activation versus a vegetative patient who's truly vegetative will never have that flicker. That light will never go on because that network is not intact. The next point is the need for nested judgment about imaging in the context of a broader sort of clinical assessment. Wilder Penfield, the great neurologist and neurosurgeon who founded the Montreal Neurologic Institute, his autobiography was called No Man Alone. He was really an inter interdisciplinarian kind of guy. And I think when we think about neuroimaging, it should be no test alone. No single test will tell you uh, the answer to your questions. How do we deal with mitigating risks and talking to families? We've got to frame it as a research result. We have to talk about contingency. There's also the issue in a lot of the surrogates that I talked to for my book, and Joe's got the same data in a different cohort, is that, that the surrogates express a right to know um, and, and, and not, to, uh, not the risk aversion that often generates what we share with people. Uh, and then how, how do we do it? We like to use the intermediary of a, of a physician who's treating the patient uh, so that there is a, there is a kind of a, a portal for that discussion. Utility, the question of utility uh, and the obligations of disclosure following Wolf and Riley as well. And, and Susan says, if there's no benefit, there's no obligation. If there's a possible benefit, it may be dis discussed and, and disclosed. <clears throat> if there's a strong net benefit, it should be discussed unless the subject or the surrogate uh, opts not to know. In my view, and this is a quote from the book, <clears throat> there's nothing more important, in my view, than knowing that a patient may be conscious especially when there was a paucity of motor output and the possibility that neuroimaging data obtained through research or not might suggest that an individual thought to be vegetative might actually be aware. I can't think of anything more important in medicine than not missing that key point because it has to do with personhood, respect for persons, and whether we discard this individual or not. Uh, what happens when you tell a family that their loved one who they thought was vegetative is in fact Oh, conscious, albeit minimally conscious. Family interactions change. Parents and spouses and kids who never talk to their loved one start talking to them. Um, there's, there's the issue of pain management. If you know somebody's minimally conscious and not vegetative, and they've got that network activation instead of what Stephen Laurie showed in his vegetative patients with the primary sensory area, and they can perceive pain then you've got a moral obligation to attend to their palliative care needs. There's a, there's a story that, that always gets me about Terry Wallace, who was a man who woke up in 2003, woke up uh, after being in a coma or vegetative state for 19 years after a car accident. These are terms that were misused in the media, a lot of media attention. In fact, he was minimally conscious for most of those 19 years. 
And in early 1990s, his mom, and by the way, every name that I share with you, I've got IRB permission, HIP approval, all those things, Bob, don't, don't, have, a, don't have a stroke. Uh, and he, we're totally covered there. Uh, Mrs. Wallace told me this story that one day in the early 90s, the nurses in, in Terry's nursing home called up Mrs. Mrs. Wallace and said, you got to come and see Terry. He's not right. The nurses evidently hadn't read the textbooks about vegetative patients being right or wrong or just basically inert. But they were these mothers and their mothers and motherly intuitions, and they said, Terry's not right. And Mrs. Wallace got to the nursing home, and she saw Terry, and he was kind of like, he looked startled, he kind of bug-eyed a little bit. And what had happened? The man, he was in this hospital, nursing home with all these elderly people, and the other bed in the room who had dementia had asphyxiated himself in his bed and died. Now, we don't know what Terry Wallace experienced, but he wasn't right. Ten years later, thanks to Joe's work, and there's a whole chapter on Joe Giacino in his life, uh, in the book, because of the, the evolution of the coma recovery scale and the minimally conscious state, we know that Terry Wallace had actually been in the minimally conscious state and had some degree of awareness at that time. So the notion of that isolation, being aware at some level, we don't know. You always, people always say, well, what, what did they feel? What did they say when they began to come out of that state and could express themselves? They're amnestic for what happened in that period of time. But there is some awareness. So the palliative care mandate. And then the last point, does it matter? Is there actionability here? The answer is yes. There is this evolution of neuroprosthetics <coughs> that can help make a difference. And there are three kinds. They're drugs, amantadine and zolpidem. Joe and John White did a large randomized clinical trial. It was in the New England Journal of Medicine a few years ago on amantadine. Devices, deep brain stimulation. Again, we collaborated on deep brain stimulation, as well as the imaging methodologies as a communication tool. So if you know somebody is minimally conscious, there are things that you can begin to think about doing. So there's actionability. Here's, here's what a, a mom said. This is uh, uh, Maggie and Nancy Worthen. Uh, and she's the main character in the book. And you know, first she says, it's a surrogate's right to know and take the risk. You know, let's move beyond paternalistic judgments that protect institutions and let's empower families. And on the information, on contingent information, she felt we must be informed, and this is a quote, but I think it still has implications for treatment even though it's contingent. It should, it would be important if you had information. At least don't share it with me, but share it with Dr. Katz, who was Maggie's doc, so he knows everything, so that he could decide treatment. And he and I could use that speculative information, how we want to treat Margaret, because we need it in order to decide on treatment and plans. And that's, that's, that's how she perceived it. The other point is, getting back to this, what you can do, is that the minimally conscious state is a state of potentiality, unlike the veg permanent vegetative state. And Jose Manuel uh, Rodriguez Delgado, who was the famous neurophysiologist who did the Stimaceber with the bull in, in, in Spain uh, was a Yale physiologist. Talks about potentiality in the brain. It's like a highway, able to accommodate traffic and facilitate the exchange of visitors among the many cities. The highway, however, cannot create cars, trucks, merchandise, businessmen, workers, and the life which circulates along it. The road makes functions possible, but by itself is a useless stretch of pavement. The minimally conscious brain is that highway system. It's that, it's that network system. And basically, what we're trying to do is drive the cars on it and, and get some activity on it. Yep. Thought differently, we want to move somebody to, onto this inflection point. Uh, and one of the tragedies and one of the hopeful things about the minimally conscious state is the longer you're in the minimally conscious state does not predict that you're not going to come out of it. There's, there's no time coefficient there. And unlike most things in medicine, the longer you're sick, the worse it's going to be. If those networks are there, there's that potentiality of them being activated. Unlike the vegetative state, once you're in the vegetative state and it's permanent, there's no return. And all those people who had late recoveries from the vegetative state were in fact probably misdiagnosed. So the idea here is this is the potentiality that we're trying to go after and why this matters. And what is at stake, I think, is fundamentally a human rights issue. A fundamental human rights issue. And this is why the book is called Rights Come to Mind. That, his, that, that if, you, if you look at the demography of this population, conscious individuals have been ignored, they've been sequestered, and they're potentially salvageable. That's not to say that I'm romanticizing this brain state. Nobody would want to be in this brain state, but let's meet people where they are. And if they're conscious, they should be recognized as such. Uh, I, I've tried to expand the arguments 
uh, from the Americans with Disabilities Act. And one of the fundamental premises of the ADA and the Olmstead decision, which was the Supreme Court upholding and expanding the ADA, was to maximally integrate people in civil society. And people's integration depends on voice. With voice comes community. And I think one of the issues when we think about consciousness and research results and research ethics is that it transcends the sort of narrow regulatory frame that we often think about these problems. I'll just skip ahead and say it's going to be complicated because if we use these techniques, people may, again, overextend uh, their utility to questions that people are not prepared to answer. So invariably, when the Monty paper came out, uh, I got asked to comment on, you know, should people be able to use this technology uh, to decide whether they want to live or die? And I, and I said, you know, we've opened up a communication channel with this technique, but in some ways it's like a very bad cell phone connection. And, and, and the bandwidth is very narrow, uh, and, and people uh, are surely not going to be at the level of consent and refusal because they can't ask questions, they can't interrogate us, um, their tension can be, can be uh, wavering. Um, there's latency of response. In a study that we did that was the John Barden study, a lot like the Monty paper, we thought people weren't responding. They were responding into the next question and outside the region of interest. So there's a lot of uh, questions there. So non-response is non-dispositive. And it's important that as we begin to bring patients in uh, through this technology and try to integrate their voice, uh, we do it in a responsible way, and I've talked about, we'll talk about this during the discussion about a mosaicism, um, so the patient's voice is integrated in a responsible way. Let me, let me give one last quote, and I'll stop, because I'm getting the look from, from Haas here, and that is to quote one of your former professors who might have taught in this very room, I don't know, Oliver Wendell Holmes, the father, and I think it's, he wrote a piece called The Borderlines of Knowledge in Some Provinces of Medical Knowledge, and science is the topography of ignorance. From a few elevated points, we triangulate the vast spaces. And he says, the best part of knowledge is that which teaches us where knowledge leaves off and ignorance begin. Nothing more so clearly separates a vulgar from a superior mind than the confusion in the first between a little that it truly knows on the one hand and what it half knows and what it knows on the other. And this is most true in knowledge which deals with living beings. I think this is a great cautionary note as we think about uh, this uh, cusp of knowledge that we're on. And I want to thank you uh, for, for your indulgence and for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joe. That wasn't quite what we planned, but I think it worked perfectly. Uh, it were, I think we're well placed now uh, to let Jim Burnett speak about uh, this issue in the context of his uh, expertise and experience in the clinical realm. Let me see if I can figure out how to get us back where we need to be. Jim, you want to come on up and... Okay. Okay, Dr. Burnett, thank you. <clears throat> Great, thanks very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Let me get that a little bigger. Big enough. Can you live with them seeing the next yeah, slide? Yeah, 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 yeah. About? Yeah, it's good for me because I don't know what's coming up next. Main C PC to projector. Secondary PC. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Great. Um, so my talk today is going to be 
about the medical practice impact of functional neuroimaging in disorders of consciousness. Uh, and uh, the overview, let's see if this works. It's not working. Let's try this. That doesn't work either. You're actually going through it. Boy. Let's try it now. That seems to work there. Oh my gosh, but you can't see it now. I'm going to close it and see if I can get it to go again. This is you. OK, I think that may be what we want. Beautiful. Good. Thank you, Tosh. OK. We're good to go here. What I'm going to talk about today is how do these functional imaging research modalities pertain to the clinical practice of managing these patients. And uh, in that consideration, I first want to talk a little bit about the traditional uh, diagnosis and prognosis as determined by the multi-society task force. And admittedly, these data are now about 25 years old. And then focus briefly on diagnosis, prognosis, communication, medical decision making, and the future. And I have a chapter in Martin Money's book coming out about this. So the um, multi-society task force was a group of 10 people representing five specialty societies who met uh, and published a two-part paper in the New England Journal in 1994 that tried to summarize what was known about the vegetative state at that point and came up with the following diagnostic criteria. Uh, and the first group was unawareness of self and environment, no sustained reproducible or purposeful voluntary behavioral response to visual, auditory, tactile, or noxious stimuli, and no language comprehension or expression. And looking at this first set of criteria, it's obvious that they're delineated in negatives. That is, what these patients cannot do, and that creates some of the problem in the diagnostic uh, realm. The second uh, part of it was that they had persisting brainstem and hypothalamic function, so there were sleep-wake cycles, preserved autonomic function, allowed uh, the patients, if they were young and had no other comorbidities, to survive with long intervals with aggressive medical and nursing care, and they had intact cranial nerve reflexes. So that the diagnosis then, uh, prior to the functional neuroimaging studies, was to fulfill what one might call the negative diagnostic criteria about what they couldn't do. Uh, and they should be examined with optimal scales. And it's been mentioned here, Joe's Coma Recovery Scale Revised, which is the state of the art for determining evidence of awareness on a neurological examination. And other things that we do at the bedside, such as having the patient gaze at uh, himself or herself in a mirror, in a hand mirror, and see if there's any flicker of recognition. Um, interviewing nurses and caregivers. Sometimes uh, family members will say that there is some evidence of responsiveness. And I know I've been called to the bedside, and sometimes I can see it when they demonstrate it, and other times I still don't see it, and I'm not sure that it exists. Uh, repeating examinations at different times and different days. These people have fluctuating levels of uh, uh, neurological function, and uh, some days there's really nothing, and other days there may be more responsiveness. Um, it's been pointed out to the false positive rates and considering the minimally conscious state. So this was the state of the art clinically prior to the first paper by Adrian Owen and his colleagues in science. Um, I wanted to just mention one other recent paper because it wasn't mentioned by the preceding speakers. And this was a paper published last year in Lancet that looked at um, fluorodeoxyglucose PET scanning and comparing its uh, positive and negative predictive value to uh, functional MRI. Most of the studies have looked at fMRI, and they looked at uh, FTG PET as well. In a cohort of 126 patients, a very large series for disorders of consciousness, 41 of whom were vegetative, 81 of whom were minimally conscious, and four locked-in syndrome. And then they correlated the findings 
on these uh, neuroimaging studies uh, to the uh, clinical findings on the coma recovery scale revised and found that the PET sensitivity for diagnosis of MCS was 93% with 85% congruence with the uh, CRSR, uh, whereas fMRI in the same group, the sensitivity was uh, 45% and congruence 63 and that um, in the vegetative people, uh, one or the other showed evidence of responsiveness in about a third of them. So uh, for diagnosis, it seemed as if the FDG PET was a little more sensitive than the fMRI. So the question is now with the introduction of this fMRI with diagnosis that there are a few patients who fulfill the clinical criteria for the vegetative state, but who show awareness uh, behavior on either fMRI or FDG PET. And therefore, they're not minimally conscious by definition because, I mean, they're, they are minimally conscious. They're not vegetative by definition because vegetative people don't have any evidence of awareness. As has been pointed out by previous speakers, false positive diagnoses of VS are, are common and result from inadequate examination. And I think in my experience, uh, some of them are, many of these are traumatic brain uh, injury patients who had been on neurosurgery services. They were clearly vegetative during the hospitalization, but during a hospitalization or a transfer to a rehab center, they've gradually recovered to minimally conscious, but that wasn't really noticed because they weren't re-examined in a very careful way. Um, and because of the negative delineation of the vegetative state criteria, which as was pointed out, invites this kind of false positive uh, uh, error. Uh, and the question then, should diagnostic criteria be expanded to include fMRI and FTG PET data? Uh, probably in the future, uh, and we'll come back to that. Now let's turn to prognosis. And looking back now at ancient history on the multi-society task force, what they said, we, I was part of that, was the prognostic data um, that in non-traumatic, most of these were hypoxic, ischemic, neuronal damage from cardiac arrest, some stroke patients, some encephalitis patients. That um, in the non-traumatic people, if there was no evidence of awareness of self or environment at three months, the probability of that occurring subsequently was very small. Uh, whereas in the trauma people, in order to achieve the same degree of diagnostic accuracy, uh, we said you had to wait a year, probably longer than that, but that's what we said. And we recognized that there were a few late recoveries and that the popular media stories of full delayed recoveries were misleading. Um, I'm not gonna have time to get into the mortality and uh, uh, that uh, business. So what's happened to the old prognostic information in the current era of functional neuroimaging? This was pointed out that, um, that Adrian Owen and, and his group, their uh, vegetative patient that was said to be vegetative, the original Science 2006 report uh, patient, uh, and then others that Martin Monti et al. Uh, described in the New England Journal in 2010. The ones who seem to show the so-called willful modulation also was that subgroup that seemed to be destined for clinical improvement. As Joe uh, Finns just pointed out, uh, many people who are vegetative, uh, particularly after traumatic brain injury, are in a transitional phase where they're going to spontaneously improve to at least the minimally conscious state. And it seems like the people who show the willful modulation by functional neuroimaging uh, are the ones most likely to be in that state who will then develop clinical evidence of awareness as Owen's patient did at 11 months. Now it's important, I think, when we look at clinical syndromes like vegetative or minimally conscious state, these are syndromes, they're not diagnoses, they have a spectrum of severity, they don't uh, imply a pathophysiology and it varies a lot, the two big groups would be the traumatic brain injury and the uh, hypoxic ischemic uh, group from cardiac arrest and the stroke groups. Uh, uh, well, it turns out that those have very different natural histories as the multi-society task force pointed out. The hypoxic ischemic neuronal damage people have the worst of those prognoses uh, and that, uh, uh, that the ones that are, have the evidence of willful modulation 
are largely restricted to the traumatic brain injury mechanism. And they are not largely the other non-traumatic forms like stroke or hypoxic ischemic neuronal damage. Now, there have been a few of those, but almost all the others are traumatic brain injury. And it's important, I think, to get out of the syndromic di diagnosis and into specific mechanisms because they have different outcomes. Um, so back to the Stender study, they looked at prognosis and compared the FDG PET to um, fMRI in their group of 126 patients that I mentioned. And it turned out that the FDG PET outcome prediction accuracy was 74%, whereas the fMRI was 56, and about a third of the so-called vegetative patients uh, were found to have awareness by one, the other, or both. And of that subgroup, 69% gradually uh, recovered clinical evidence of awareness. So that, I think, shows again that the FDG PET seems to be prognostically uh, have higher positive predictive value for uh, improve, clinical improvement subsequently. And uh, if you chose the willful modulation, that's the subgroup destined to improve spontaneously. Uh, both prior speakers have mentioned the communication issue uh, and the one patient of Mondi that was taught to use yes or no. And remember this picture now everyone has shown, um, or Adrian Owen's uh, picture with the um, tennis imagery and the spatial navigation and the idea that one patient who was taught uh, successfully to think about tennis for yes and spatial navigation and walking in the house of the room for no was able to have a communication system that was accurate. But this is a very unusual circumstance, despite the fact that there are now quite a few reported people who can do the willful modulation, and the question is why. And the answer seems to be that there are serious um, physical barriers to language production, understanding and production in this subgroup of patients. And that is, they have a high incidence of aphasia because of language dominant hemisphere damage that occurred in the traumatic brain injury. Many of them have global cognitive impairment from diffuse brain damage of varying types. Uh, there's sedation from anticonvulsant drugs and other medications that are given, and there are medical comorbidities involving heart, lung, liver disease, kidney disease that produce metabolic encephalopathies that further depress brain function. And, and the totality of all these factors leads to the outcome, which is that the ability to use this language to establish a reliable communication system is a very rare phenomenon indeed but we should try to do that. Um, a word about medical decision making. We like to have medical decision making patient-centered and not physician-centered, which is the old way of doing it, um, and that the willful modulation with communication potentially allows patient to communicate uh, by participating, although that's rare, as I said. But one question it raises is whether a yes-no response, what I would call a binary response, is sufficient to create a valid consent for treatment or refusal. And um, the best model for addressing this question is our locked-in syndrome, which is much more common, and we have a lot more experience in trying to communicate with these people. In the old days, before we had computerized systems that had laser beams on the corneas and allowed people to do more sophisticated forms of communication, we were re left with only uh, vertical eye movements or eye blinking and, uh, of course, you know, people like Jean-Dominique Bobby uh, in his uh, book, The Diving Bell and the Butterfly, was able to dictate that by eye movements. But um, for the most part, yes, no answers uh, don't give the richness and the nuance that we need to make clinical decisions, particularly regarding uh, whether someone should continue to be treated or not. So I would argue that although this is exciting with using Wolfram modulation by fMRI, that we need to be a little cautious about what we do with that information. So in summary, the impact of fMRI and FDG imaging is that patterns of cortical activation may suggest the presence of awareness behavior in some patients in whom the neurological examination does not, even done in an optimal way. And the same patterns can be predictive of um, pro uh, prognosis, that is, identifying that subset who is destined spontaneously
to have a higher probability of improving and that therefore they may become useful clinically and make that transition from their current status as research tools into a clinical uh, usefulness. But before we do that, we need more detailed studies with greater numbers of patients to establish true predictive positive and negative predictive values, um, to get more uniformity in the paradigms for uh, doing this. We need more reliable funding. Uh, uh, this is a group of patients that are uh, not, uh, there's no mechanism for getting a lot of funding for them. A lot of the funding for the research is from private endowments, and uh, we need better and more reliable funding. Uh, this will uh, allow us to map the anatomy and physiology of human consciousness to revise later, and I think we will, and maybe the next five or eight years, revise the diagnostic criteria of uh, vegetative and minimally conscious state to incorporate these types of studies. And I'd be interested to hear from Joe Giacino in your work with the development of the new diagnostic criteria for this, where you think this belongs. Uh, and of course, improving technology of communication for those few patients who retain that capacity. So thank you very much. So I'm going to have our speakers uh, come up to the table and grab microphones if they could. And David's going to uh, man the microphone and uh, take questions from the audience. But I, I think uh, Dr. Giacino set us up with the first uh, question that I think will touch on most of the aspects uh, that are in play here. Uh, imagine, that, imagine uh, Dr. Bernat, Dr. Finns, that we've got a patient who uh, is, in a, is in a coma shortly after a traumatic brain injury. Uh, we've got this research protocol available. We could use this protocol outside of the study uh, without much extra expense or extra time, uh, and we could potentially use it to inform the clinical care for this patient. Uh, and uh, Dr. Giacino set us up with a yes, no, maybe, and I'd love to, I'd love to hear everybody's perspective on where they come down on that. So, could you just restate the final part of the question? Yes, no, maybe. No, it's um, if, <laughs> you've, got a, you've got a patient in whom you could use your available research protocol to, to, to study them using fMRI yeah. and look for evidence of awareness that's not clinically evident now. Uh, and it won't cost anybody anything significant to do it. Uh, and the question is, uh, are you permitted to do it? Are you obliged to do it? Are you forbidden from doing it? Uh, and, if, and on what grounds? Yeah. I think it's worth first mentioning that the number of institutions that have this capacity is very small. It's very different than uh, things like ordinary MRI where you put the patient in one end of the machine and the images come out the other and uh, they're all relatively uniform and we know what to do with them, we know how to read them. Uh, these are experimental uh, paradigms that are designed on site. They've gone through a lot of sophisticated processing and clever um, technology to, to get them, and they're not exactly exportable. So first of all, the probability that someone would be admitted to a place where they could even do this is pretty small. So, but let's take your question and take the minority uh, probability that, okay, well, someone is admitted, say, to um, New York Hospital, New York Presbyterian Hospital now, um, and uh, where they do have this capacity, uh, then I think that um, a strong case could be made that uh, with proper consent about what it might mean that, that this could be done, I think that any time you're taking something, and this is the whole nature of translational research, that is basically a laboratory technique and you're considering using it, there should be some learning that uh, occurs from it, and whether it be an N of one trial or some other uh, way of using that information, I think it should, be, it should be used. But I think it would be hard if you had the capacity and the situation existed not to 
um, to do that, but I think that it should be incorporated into some kind of a learning uh, research methodology. I, I agree, I think, but I, I think we have to be very cautious about being seduced by the technology and, and, not, and not, you know, I would rather have fly Joe Giacino up for a fraction of the cost and have you do a good exam. Because we, as we've seen, that's, that's, that's more predictive and it's better. There are also so many confounders in the acute setting that, that you, could, you could really get a result that could be very misleading. And, and these people just carry these diagnoses with them. And it, and it, makes it may make it very difficult for them to get insurance. They get labeled as vegetative or not. And in fact, it's, a, it's, not, it's not a permanent you know, state that they're in. So I think, um, so I would be wary because I'm not sure it's going to add very much. There's a, there's a potential of a harmful label um, and the information uh, can be obtained in a better way with more careful clinical work. Uh, but we tend to jump to the technology quickly. So I would say, um, you know, if it's part of a protocol, if it's well understood, uh, but I wouldn't do a one-off because I don't think it's really helpful. It's not to say we shouldn't do structural studies because that can be very important. Um, but I'd be very wary um, uh, because I think it, it doesn't really add very much and it could be harmful. Could I ask a follow-up question? Um, I've got a thing here. Um, given that you're one of the centers that studies these people, um, would that be a, would there be a possibility for them to be? We don't. We wouldn't do it. You know, we, we probably wouldn't do it in that context. We, we, it would be on a protocol. We don't have a protocol for that. The people that come to us are in a more chronic state. So, and let me just maybe make this a little trickier. Um, so, well, I, can, I think I can say that while it's true that these protocols are not running on every hospital's scanners in some places, and let's assume now that we begin to see diagnostic centers pop up, or so places specialized to do this. So if you go to MGH now, the imaging package that's standard incorporates a lot of these measures, so the, or these sequences. So they're not special in that setting anymore, and that becomes very interesting now. So you'll have fMRI, you'll have ETI, and lots of other sort of advanced sequences as a standard part of the protocol now for imaging. So think about that. But here's the thing. So the flip side of what families say, and remember the scenario that was painted was, the clinician is also the researcher in that example and is you know, left with this difficult situation of discussing prognosis with the family. So families actually also said to us, sort of out of the other side of their mouths, that they were not comfortable with um, clinicians necessarily being furnished with the results of investigational studies because that information could, one of two things could happen. It could enter the thinking of that clinician. So if the study was negative, they can't undo that. And so now that clinician is less, potentially less invested or changes the path of care to some extent because of that, even if consciously they would say they would never do that, that they couldn't prevent that from happening. And then the other, which was a very practical issue, was the possibility that a clinician would write a note in the chart that would then be audited by an insurance company who then saw the negative findings reported, and that might have impact on future authorization of care. I'm going to open it up to questions for a sec. So, Dr. Finns, I appreciate your defense of a good clinical exam, but you seem to be walking away from the worth in case that you describe in detail, and the very good rationale that the family give for wanting the findings of neuroimaging to be entered into right. the understanding of the state of their family member. The big difference was that, that uh, this was, that particular patient um, was diagnosed as vegetative when she came to us. Uh, her neurologist here in Boston wasn't sure that was true. And the neuroimaging was, was contextualized against a really good set of clinical evaluations. And it was kind of like a tiebreaker. Um, the other point, which is really important, it was nowhere near the acute stage. It was, it was in the chronic stage. Um, and <clears throat> so I think it's a difference that really, 
is important about where you are in the timeline um, because you know she was already in either the permanent vegetative state or in that kind of uh, minimally conscious state where uh, she had yet to emerge uh, with reliable communication. So it was a different context. All right, we actually also have a question from Twitter. So we're going to uh, answer this question from Twitter. Thank you. So this is a question coming in from our um, online audience uh, from Philip Kellmeyer of the University of Freiburg. So uh, a lot of the focus um, has been on fMRI assessment of consciousness. Um, but what is the role, current or future, for electrophysiology? And especially when we talk about communication, as you did, um, does fMRI-based communication have a future given its low bit rate and practical constraints? Or should we start to think about brain-computer interfaces, and if we start to think about that, you know, what do you know, these electrophysiological-based devices uh, pose in terms of new ethical dilemmas in these patients? So hi, Philip. <laughs> I know him. Uh, so this was a, this was a controversial uh, discussion a few years ago. Uh, Damian Cruz, Adrian Owen wrote a piece uh, that was in The Lancet uh, purporting to use uh, EEG as a way to identify conscious in our group, led up by Nico Schiff, John Victor, uh, Andy Goldfein, we disputed the findings. And we thought it did, they didn't make biological sense, and it was kind of a signal-to-noise problem. And uh, there was an exchange of letters, and you guys can read, uh, it, read them and decide uh, whose side you come out on. But one of the issues that I think is important is that, that the barrier to entry for EEG is so much lower than this technology that if you're wrong, you've cloned a huge mistake. Um, so we've got to get it right. Do I think that EEG eventually will play a major, and does sort of play a major role, and there's other work that is very, very uh, constructive, I do think it will play a major role. But again, it's the same issues about test uh, specificity. And again, it has to be contextualized. It's going to be no single test by itself is going to be able to give us these answers. It really is a, it's going to be a kind of a, a portfolio of evaluations that's going to help us understand whether somebody is in one of these brain states when the exam, the clinical exam, doesn't tell us already. So I, I think we're going to get our answer much more quickly because these studies are, are um, being completed at a much faster rate than they are for neuroimaging. Um, the paradigms are very similar, more flexible, uh, you know, using evoked potentials. So, um, but I think they're fraught with all the same difficulties that fMRI is. I just think that we will have more data faster to figure out the, what the sensitivity specificity is. The one maybe exception to this is uh, the group in Milan who's <laughs> coupled, um, you guys probably know about this, uh, coupled uh, TMS with EEG and um, developed an index um, called the Perturbational Complexity Index. And basically what they did was a t pulse of TMS to perturb the brain and then used EEG to track the spatial and temporal uh, trajectory of the signal, and skipping all the details, were able with 100% accuracy to sort individuals using this PCI, this, which is a mathematical index, to sort individuals who were conscious from those who were not. So this was a very impressive study. Um, interestingly, the, 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 it couldn't work out gradations of um, consciousness. So in other words, it treated MCS patients uh, who were very low functioning, only had visual pursuit the same way as individuals who were basically just about communicating uh, reliably. But when you, and, and they were able to do this with um, controls under anesthesia, um, people asleep and awake, and then individuals who were unconscious, i.e. vegetative or comatose, versus those who were minimally conscious, emerged from the minimally conscious state or locked in. Um, that has not been replicated yet, but this is a very well-designed study that um, could change the game a bit. All right. Thank you. All right, so we have a couple more minutes, so one more brief question. 
so I guess to go even even a little bit simpler than uh, you know fMRI EEG or TMS EEG, has anybody pitted this against just very strict clinical exam? In other words, we're going to have three different docs examine you every single hour, multiple times per day, you know, for every day in a row for a month. And what percentage of vegetative state patients then show signs of conscious awareness when you do that? And how does that compare to, you know, these yeah. people that we're now examining with fMRI or EEG or TMS EEG? So yes and no. Yes, in the sense that the gold standard, if you look in the literature, is consensus-based or team consensus-based team diagnosis. So the studies that you, you saw cited, the Schnaker studies, which are probably the best and most recent, um, compared the team's consensus diagnosis against these other measures. So the but you also asked, you posed the question very specifically. You know, they looking at this patient over a series of multiple studies in the same day over seven days. That answer is no. Nobody has done that. Um, there's uh, at least one paper out now that is, that does look at the fluctuations in the course of a day, um, which and it, it becomes very interesting because if you were to use one of those exams for diagnostic purposes you're going to get the exam changing literally in some cases hour by hour. So this point about the transience of the state is really important. I mean, that said, there's really strong evidence that the diagnosis, and Joe made a really good point before, which I think shouldn't be missed, and that is the diagnosis is the peak exam. You can't accidentally get up there. You can go down. You can you know, sort of downregulate for many different reasons and often, but you can't accidentally get to a point where you're clearly following commands. So that, that really is, the, 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 I think, what, the, 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 what, what should be used as the indicator. But the question is, how many exams do you have to do to capture that? And that we don't know the answer to yet. It's worth mentioning, since we're talking about functional neuroimaging at this uh, discussion, that the same fluctuations occur in that, that occur in the clinical examination. And that if you just did one exam at one point, yeah. it's going to give you one piece of information. But if you repeated it at six hours later or two days later, it may be another, just as there is fluctuation in the, uh, the physical examination. So it just adds to the complexity of, uh, of these. Uh, this is just a quick follow-up. I also want to... One of the reasons the bold might be picking up on this is, is you have to wait. No, sorry, you have to wait 10 seconds after you ask the question, just because of the delayed nature of the hemodynamic response. And so, you know, I've examined a lot of these patients at the bedside. How often do I wait 10 seconds for them to move their eyes one direction or another after I ask the question? You usually ask the question. If I don't see an eye movement within a few seconds, I ask my next question or so pull which, out my mirror. Which actually, Mike, may account for why the CRS performs as well. It has a fixed 10-second response window. Now, how did we get to 10 seconds? Pretty damn arbitrary, but we standardized that, and for 25 years, it stayed the same. It's you know not longer than that. It's not shorter than that. I don't know if it's right. Um, we actually wrote a grant to see if it was right. It didn't, didn't get funded, <laughs> but but I think that that's another really good point here. So, uh, you know, when we do these bedside exams, so what you're getting at now is how you interpret a response. So what's the window within which one should wait before you decide, yes, that's clearly there or that's not? The CRS standardizes, and that and many other things. So I think that, that may be its crowning glory. All right, so we're out of time. Uh, thank you so much to our panelists for coming. Uh, thank you all for coming as well. Um, yeah, round of applause. Yeah. <laughs>